today is Baptism Sunday, and our hope is for you to believe your baptism. That's our desire for you this morning. And so I wanna encourage you to grab your scriptures and go with me to Romans chapter six. That's where we'll be together this morning. And maybe as you're turning there, maybe say hello to your neighbor if you haven't met them and maybe even say to them, believe your baptism. Take a minute to do that while you're also finding Romans chapter six. And again, grateful that you're with us. And for those of you who are wondering, we will continue our Psalm 119 series next Sunday. And if you have completed the, the reading challenge, man, way to go. If you haven't joined us for the reading challenge, you can still grab one of these bookmarks on your way out and guest services and, and, start, and start the challenge today. But let's turn our attention to Romans chapter 6. We're going to read beginning of verse 1 all the way through verse 13 because the text is everything. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Far from it. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in the newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For the one who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all time. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. So you too consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, sin is not to reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the parts of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead and your body parts as instruments of righteousness for God. Amen. You know, as a parent, there are lots of, lots of challenges and lots of joy. And as a parent, I have found a new skill. And that skill is asking rhetorical questions. And I've gotten really good at it. I wasn't, I didn't do this as a teenager, but I can say, are, are you going to leave that backpack there? And the backpack disappears. Or I can say, are you going to, to leave the, those dishes on the table? And those dishes will find themselves in the sink, even better, sometimes actually in the dishwasher. Or I can say, um, does it look like the recycle bin's full? And, and, and all of a sudden, the recycle gets taken outside. And it's like a superpower for parents to have this ability to, to ask rhetorical questions. You should try it if you haven't. But here we're going to see that Paul begins this passage by asking a rhetorical question. And rhetorical questions aren't really questions, are they? They're statements trying to produce an effect. And I love it. And here we're going to see the Apostle Paul is doing just that in verse 1. Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Now, I want to be very clear. Salvation, one being reconciled to God, is by the grace of God through Jesus Christ alone. And I want to be real clear. I want to put a period right there. We are saved by grace through faith, period. That's the truth that we hold to tightly. But apparently... In the church in Rome, there were some Christians who became Christians, and they are enjoying this new relationship with God that they never had. And they're understanding that God is a gracious God, and he gives grace upon grace upon grace, and that they had the salvation that they didn't have to work for, that it was freely given to them. And maybe some of them are starting to think, you know what, this is so good, I'm going to keep on sinning so that God will keep on forgiving. And this would be like a new husband just being married to his new wife. 
and realizing this, this covenant relationship and built on this unconditional love and, and he still finds time to go back to former lovers. Now, if that's happening, come talk to me or better go to our marriage conference this next week. But Paul is going to answer this rhetorical question with a loud and clear no, as strong as he possibly can. He's going to say, yes, God's grace is abounding, but no, verse two, far from it. We are not to go on sinning. And his reasoning is also found in verse two. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? His point is a Christian, you died to sin and a dead person can't sin. And to bring this home to these people so that they understand it and live by it. I noticed something that I've never noticed before and I wanna share it with you. There's a connection here with their personal baptism experience. Look with me at verse three. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? And so there is a link here between their personal baptism experience and their freedom from sin. And I've never noticed that connection before. But before we get to that link, before we unpack that, I want us to look at a couple of observations. And I get these observations really from two assumptions that the Apostle Paul makes in verse 3. And the first assumption that the Apostle Paul makes is that they should know this teaching about baptism because he says to them in verse three, do you not know? Again, that's a rhetorical question, implying you all should know this. And so already in the early church, there's this foundational doctrinal teaching about baptism. That's the first assumption we see Paul makes. Then you see the second assumption. He assumes that all the Christians in Rome, all have been baptized, meaning baptism for the believer was not optional. It wasn't something that was done privately either. And so we see these two assumptions from Paul, that they should know this foundational doctrine about baptism already, and that baptism for the believer isn't an option. And this should not surprise us because we know what Jesus said in his great commission. In his great commission, when he talks and, and sends his followers to go make disciples, he includes baptism, baptism. And then we see some really interesting things in the book of Acts about baptism. In Acts chapter two, verse 41, it says, so then those who had received his word, Peter had just preached a sermon about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it says, those who received his word were then baptized, were baptized. Again, it wasn't an, op it wasn't an option, it, just something they did after they placed their faith in Jesus. And then if you go and look at Acts chapter 16, there's another example of a, a lady named Lydia. And the Bible says that she opened her heart to receive, to respond to the message of Jesus Christ. And it says she and her household had been baptized. And so what we see in the early church, and I could show you more examples, is that it was believers who were baptized. They received the word, and then they stepped in the baptism, got baptized. They believed and were baptized. And when we talk about baptism here, we talk about immersion. The word baptism means, it's baptizo. It means to dunk, go all the way underneath the water. And that's how we practice baptism here. And again, in Matthew chapter three, when you read about Jesus's baptism, it's really clear that Jesus, when he was baptized, the scripture says that he came up out of the water, implying that Jesus himself was dunked. And then there's this great story in Acts chapter eight. Philip is teaching Jesus to an Ethiopian. And they must have had some conversation after he preached Jesus, they must have had a conversation about baptism because it says they're riding along in the chariot and, and the Ethiopian says, hey, look, there's water. Can I get baptized now? And so we read this in Acts chapter eight, verse 38. And he ordered the chariot stop and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him when they came up out of the water. And so believers' baptism by immersion in the first, first century was a priority. Now, baptism is not salvific, it's not saving, but it is significant. 
And I'm just going to put this out here for you this morning. It's baptism Sunday. We, we baptize at the 830. We're going to be baptizing at the 11. But this is one of the rare occasions since I've been here. We have no one to baptize this hour. But the water is ready. And it's warm, by the way. And so here's what I want to challenge you. If you are a believer, meaning you've been saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ alone, but you've not taken that next step to be baptized, then maybe today is your day. Now, I know some may say, man, I was baptized as a teen. I was was saved as a teenager. I didn't get baptized then. I'm a little bit embarrassed to, to say that. That's okay. This is a safe place. It happens. We've had grown men get in, the, get in the water and have shared that testimony. And so I'm going to ask you to have courage. I'm going to keep on preaching. And out in the foyer, we have some of our pastors. And if you are a believer, and again, maybe you've been a believer for a week or a month or a year or 10 years or 20 years, but you've yet to experience believer's baptism, then I'm going to ask you to have the courage to stand up and make your way out to the foyer to talk with one of our pastors to get you ready this hour to get baptized. And we're just praying that if that's you, that God's spirit would embolden you and empower you to get up from your seat as I keep preaching and to go out those doors and to find a pastor to talk with. Because again, water is ready and it is warm. And why not today? You see it in the book of Acts. People were people were saved and immediately were baptized. So maybe that's your story today. As you've heard this, you're thinking, I need to do that today. They're in the foyer ready to receive you. But I'm going to keep on going because remember I said there's this connection. There's a connection here between personal baptism and their freedom from sin. Look at verse three with me again. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death. Now, why, why is this connection? Why does Paul put this connection out here? Why? I think it's because baptism is so significant. Baptism is a symbol that is meant to stimulate and is meant to encourage the believer that they are dead to sin and they are to walk in a new life. And I want to be transparent with you. I want to go below the line with you. I've never had a mentor. I've never had a close friend say something like this to me. That when I've struggled with sin, they've not come alongside me and said, hey, Eric, remember? Remember the day that you stepped into the water? Remember the the day that you got baptized? You remember what happened, how you went underneath the water and how you came up out of the water? Eric, that, that's a picture of you dying to sin and having and experiencing freedom from sin. And that's meant to stimulate and encourage me to walk in a new life. And I must confess, as a pastor, I don't recall a time where I've come alongside a Christian brother or a Christian sister and said, hey, I know you're struggling with this sin or this bad habit. Can I remind you of your baptism? Can I remind you of the moment when you stepped in to the water? What that symbolized? That it symbolized you dying to sin. That sin no longer is your master. That it's been buried. And that now you walk in new life. But this is why baptism is so significant. And I think this is what Paul is wanting them to understand, that baptism is a symbol to help them live and walk in the freedom that they have, a life free from the mastery of sin. And so Paul, in this beautiful way, connects their personal baptism experience to to their freedom from sin. And now look with me at verse four. He's gonna unpack baptism and the story that baptism tells. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness 
of life. And so when you see someone get baptized and they go under the water, that's a picture of them dying to sin. And when they come up out of the water, the apostle Paul says, that's a picture of them being raised to walk in a new life. And that one day, just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, they too will be raised from the dead. This is baptism's story. This is baptism's picture for you and for me and for the Christians in Rome. We see this also, this story, it's so well illustrated in the life of Lazarus. In Lazarus, his story in John chapter 11, we read that Lazarus, is, is, it, he dies and he's buried in the tomb. But at the words of Jesus, Lazarus, it says he comes walking out of the tomb. And at the command of Jesus, they, stay, they start taking off his grave clothes and he's walking in new life. And what happened to Lazarus is what happens to us in baptism. It was we die to our sin and we are buried. But when we come up out of that water, we're taking off our grave clothes. As the book says in Galatians chapter three, we are clothing ourselves with Christ. That's your story. And that's my story when we get baptized is that we're putting off the old and we are putting on Christ. And Paul so wants Christians in Rome to feel this. Now, I want to take just a moment to talk about sprinkling. We don't practice sprinkling here. I know we have some who have been sprinkled as a child or an infant. And we, we, we don't sprinkle here. Sprinkling doesn't capture the dramatic story of death to life like immersion does. Believers' baptism by immersion pictures this and stories this, this picture of, of being dead to sin and then being a new person. And so if you've been sprinkled, I, I don't want to speak against that, but I'm just saying it doesn't, doesn't give us the picture of what immersion does, the story of dead to life. And so baptism, as we see in Romans 6, reminds us that we're united with Christ in his death, that we're no longer slave to sin, but we're united also with him in his resurrection. In the first 10 verses, the apostle Paul uses the word no three times. And so for us to believe our baptism is to know what God has done for you. It's to know what God has done for you. That's what it means to believe your baptism. But to know what God has done for you and not live in it leaves many of us to be what Warren Wiersbe calls in-betweeners, in-betweeners. Has anyone ever seen the movie Shawshank Redemption? It's a great movie if you haven't seen it. Shawshank Redemption is about these men who find themselves in prison. And there's a man in prison, his name is Brooks. And Brooks finally gets released from prison. He's released from prison, but he struggles to live in his freedom because as one character, Red, says, he's been in institutionalized. And so even though Brooks is freed from prison, he's, he's not living in the freedom that he can enjoy. He's an in-betweener. And many of us, we live as in-betweeners, but not Lazarus. Not Lazarus. Lazarus, again, he was dead and he was buried into the tomb. He came up out of that tomb in his grave clothes. And, and Jesus says, get those grave clothes off. And you know where we find Lazarus next? We find Lazarus hosting a banquet for Jesus. And the scripture says he's reclining at the table with Jesus. And I love this picture of going from the tomb to the table. But many of us, we are living in between the tomb and the table. We've been set free, but we're not sitting at the table with Jesus. We're not enjoying and experiencing the freedom that Christ has purchased for us. And so we're living as in-betweeners but not Lazarus, not Lazarus. He's at the table with Jesus, enjoying and experiencing the freedom that has been bought for 
But look at verse 11. So you too. So you too consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So you too, Paul says, consider. See, Romans 6 says, because of Christ's work, we are dead to sin and we are alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's what Romans 6 is the truth that's over us. It's our reality as people of faith. We are dead to sin and we are raised to walk in a new life. We are to live for God in Christ Jesus. This is our story. This is true about you and true about me. And Paul says, consider it. That word consider is, a, is an accounting term. So if you and I were to go to the local coffee shop and I were to, to, to stand at the counter, I, I, would, I'd, I would order just a, a black Americano and nothing in it. And I would say, what do you want? And, and you could share your, your order. And I would pull out my debit card. And with a great deal of confidence, I would hand my debit card to the barista. And I would pay for our coffee. And I would do that with confidence. Do you know why? Because I know that there's money in the bank, at least enough money to pay for two coffees. But I can have confidence because I know there's money in the bank. And the apostle Paul is telling the church in Rome, consider this, like bank on this, that you are dead to sin and you are alive to God in Christ Jesus. He said, that's not a debate. That's not something that you should question. Paul says, it's something for you to consider. It's something for you to bank on. You're dead to sin and you are alive to God in Christ Jesus. He's already been talking about it. Now he says to you and me, consider it. Believe it. Bank on it. Be who God has made you. And that is dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And this is what it means for you and for me to believe our baptism. It's to be who God has made us to be. And that is one who is dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. But what does it look like to bank on this truth? What does it look like to practice what's been purchased for you and me? Look with me at verse 12. Therefore, sin is not to reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the parts of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. So if we are to be who God has made us to be, there is a negative to this. And that is cutting ties to the old self. It's cutting ties to the previous lifestyle. It's cutting ties to the sins that we used to walk in. And so for us to believe our, our baptism and to be all who God wants us to be, there's a negative part for us to, and that's to cut ties with the old self. But there's also a positive. Look with me, and this continues in this verse. But present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead and offer your body parts as instruments of righteousness for God. Here's the positive side. So there's a negative, but there's a positive. We are to present ourselves to God. We're to offer ourselves to God. This word where it says that we are to present, it's the idea of a, a bystander, someone going and standing by someone to be at their disposal. Jesus said in one of the gospels, in the gospel of Matthew, he said, I could call down legions of angels who would be at my disposal. That's this idea of presenting ourselves, that we place ourselves beside God. We offer our bodies at his disposal. And this is how we believe our baptism. And this is how we, we be who God has called us to be. As we cut ties with the old self and we offer our bodies at his disposal to be used however he wants us to be used. It's Moses offering his hand to part the water so that the people of God can be free from Pharaoh and the Egyptians. It's David offering his sling 
to slay the giant. It's the sons of Korah offering their songs so that people can praise God through music. It's the little boy's sack lunch offering that at God's disposal to feed thousands and thousands of people. It's Lydia in the New Testament offering her home as the first Christian home in Europe. It's the many teams in our very own church made up of men and women who who give their time to God at his disposal to minister to many in our congregation and in our county. It's like one of our church members, Pam, it's offering as she offers her heart and her home at God's disposal to minister to fellow widows. It's another church member named Larry who offers up his land for church events and for evangelistic events for international students. It's another church member in our church, Alicia, using her gift of hospitality and offering at God's disposal to help people feel welcome and warm. What does it look like for you? What does it look like for you to believe your baptism in a way that helps you to be all that God has called you to be? What can you offer to God to be at his disposal? Is it your time? Is it your resources? Is it your gift that he's given you? What is God calling you to offer for him to use to bless others? to glorify him and to give you joy. Friends, to believe our baptism is to be who God has called us to be. And our baptism experience says that we are dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Would you please pray with me? I just want you right where you are, maybe just take a minute for you to talk to God personally and maybe ask him, ask his spirit to speak to you about what it looks like for you to offer him something at his disposal. And maybe for the one too, that you have been walking with Jesus for some time You've been saved for years or maybe decades, but you've yet to step into the water. I just wanna challenge you to have the courage to take that next step of obedience and to follow your Lord and Savior. And maybe for the one among us who is without Christ in this world, We're praying for you. We're glad you are here and we just pray that God's spirit would make you born again so you can experience freedom from sin, freedom from sin having mastery over your life and that you can be raised to walk in new life. And so, fathers, your people, we do thank you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, how he paid our debt to make us alive to God in Christ Jesus. And God, may we be a church, may we be a people that believes our baptism, that, that we do so in a way that we, we walk in who you've made us to be. People who have died to sin, committed to to living for and honoring you. And we pray this in the great and mighty and powerful name of King Jesus and all God's people said together, amen.